Next up, we have another distinguished speaker, Martin Heijer, Secretary General of the European Gaming and Betting Association, the EGBA. Martin will talk about the implementation of the Dutch Remote Gaming Act and the future traps and pitfalls that we should be wary of. What can we learn from similar processes in other European countries? I'm sure that Martin has quite a few valuable insights to offer. Martin, over to you. This, yeah. Thank you very much. Like, like the other speakers, first time in a public event, uh, magnificent building. Um, also the first time, I think in nine months, I have to wear a suit again and a tie, so it's, it all feels quite uncomfortable. But I'm happy to be out here and it's a fantastic setting and thank you for organizing this. Um, and uh, welcome to, to the event. There's supposed to be a clicker here somewhere as well, I think, for my presentation. It's, uh, this is the TV, I guess. Okay, um, I'll start. So I'm representing EGBA, the so European Gaming and Betting Association. We're a Brussels-based uh, organization of online gaming providers, uh, all licensed and established in the EU. Uh, and uh, our members have licenses in, in, in a lot of jurisdictions. These are our members. And I, thank you, show you as well where we have licenses and uh, where our, the offices of the members are. I mean, this is information of 2018. There are two uh, significant developments. One is that uh, Zeal, that used to be an EGBA member, had a license in the Netherlands, but I don't think, maybe they still have it, but they don't operate it as far as I know. And uh, secondly, they're no longer a member of EGBA, so it's a, a double disappointment. But at least you can see that our members have a lot of uh, licenses, over 120 licenses in, the, in, in Europe. Um, and there you see some of the figures as well. So we are, of course, keenly interested, our members are keenly interested in getting and obtaining licenses, including in the Netherlands. And these are the places where you can get a license. You see on the left um, the situation in 2009 and uh, on the right 2019. And in dark green are those countries that have uh, a multi-licensing model uh, like currently being negotiated or actually being implemented now in the Netherlands as well. So dark green is where there are opportunities to get a license. Light green are those jurisdictions, including the Netherlands, where this is under discussion. Um, it doesn't mean dark green that the legislation functions particularly well or badly. I mean, any, anyone that has any knowledge of what's happening in Germany or well aware that Germany has the model in principle, but it, the market as such doesn't function very well. Now, I have to say that since 2009 and 2019 now, there are many opportunities to get a license, but I think our operators have become more critical as well. Uh, that's because there are so many different requirements, different licenses to get, different restrictions, that it becomes very complicated. And some of them are not that attractive. I, I give you an example of France. In 2020, 2010, sorry, the market opened and uh, I think 50, 55 operators got a license and by now only 17 have a license left and that's because the conditions are too difficult to really properly function. So I think this is something that's with so many jurisdictions opening up um, that is becoming a difficulty and that's something that I think we in the Netherlands should be aware of as well. The fact that a license model is being opened doesn't necessarily mean that licenses will be attractive enough for operators or that the market will function well. And if you read the KSA excellent market vision document, I think there's a lot of good information about a properly functioning market. And the other thing, and then I'll, I'll go to the Netherlands, the other thing I think we need to be aware of, that a lot of operators that are larger are now also looking outside of Europe. So obviously North America, Latin America, we noticed in our daily work, people that we used to work with solely for Europe are now responsible for Europe and, and the US or actually living and working in the US only. And so I think the attention of operators is shifting away from Europe, or at least it's being divided slash shifted away from the, at least the larger market players. And I think that's something we should be aware of. Obviously, uh, our members look keenly also at the Dutch market. Um, and I noticed with interest Mr. Janssen saying that there will be no delay. The 1st of September 2021 it will be. Uh, the CASA actually exists to ensure consumer uh, play safely. I think that's a very important um, 
and uh, variable statement as well. So we're now entering the final straight, um, and it's important to get it right, as I said. Um, but I do still have to say that I find it disappointing, although obviously it's not the Gaza's choosing, um, that the government and parliament has gone for a channeling rate of 80%. So that means that we're aiming in the Netherlands to get 80% of the players within the regulated environment, and we, we take for granted, because that's uh, what it is, that 20% of the people that play online play on the black market. And I, I personally find that surprising and disappointing, and I would like to think that that might be the starting point, but we're going to, we being Dutch, uh, the CASA, the government, and, and everyone is going to aim for higher, because I looked it up, 80% uh, might sound high, but in 2018 figures, I think Bulgaria, Czech Republic, Belgium, and Hungary had higher channeling rates than, than 80%. So we're lower than those countries actually in channeling rates and similar to Spain and Croatia. So I, I find it surprising and, and, uh, and disappointing, but I, I hope that we, that we aim to do better from the 1st of March, hopefully onwards. So I won't really comment too much on the process ahead. I think the beleidsregels that are being discussed that Mr. Janssen also alluded to are very important to get it right. Uh, and um, I think that, that there is a challenge there to make sure that it will function when the market opens, it will function properly. Um, once it's up and running, because we've discussed now a lot about how to get there, but once it's up and running, I think one of the things that we need to realize, looking at other markets, is um, when uh, the market is open, is how do we ensure that the sector is sort of integrated in society. I think that's a big challenge if you look at what's happening in different jurisdictions, Spain, uh, the UK, other places as well, Italy. I think there's a, a problem with public acceptance of the sector. Um, and that is something there that we need to, as a, a, every stakeholder in this sector, this being an operator, being the CASA, being the ministry, sponsorship deals, we need to make sure that we um, that the public at least um, appreciates the presence of it. We, ca we cannot alienate public opinion from the existence of the sector. And that is something that there is a joint responsibility, I think, for all actors. And regardless of whether you're now an incumbent, you already have a license or you're a new licensee, once the market opens up, gambling is gambling and that's it. Uh, and so we have a joint interest there. Um, I think you know, it's called sustainability. It's a bit of a, it's a fashionable statement, but I do think it's extremely important that getting to the opening of the market is only the beginning. But looking at other markets, I think the real challenge is to make sure that, um, yeah, that we as a sector can have a, a proper long-term place in the market in industrial society. So I give a few examples of this, where I think we can, do, we have to do better, where we uh, must do better as well, or where, where it's important to, to um, the relationship between the sector and the society. I think COVID was just discussed. Um, I didn't know that uh, Peter would go into so much detail into it, but we, we also, I also dug up some information. Uh, and I think it confirms more or less what Peter also said, that COVID didn't make uh, online gambling explode, despite the idea that people alone would start gambling a lot. And actually, I mean, this is information that we dug up. It's not a study, uh, but it, it, I think it confirms, unless I'm mistaken, Peter, also what you suggested. Uh, yes, there's been in some jurisdictions some uptake of online casino, but certainly not compensating for the loss of um, sports betting. Um, yeah, but these are the facts. And then what you saw in the public opinion uh, was a quite a um, five minutes, <laughs> quite a, a critical voice uh, about the fear of people that um, many more people start gambling online. When we spoke with uh, governments and uh, commission officials, they said, "Well, you have a good deal because now people start gambling like crazy and making money." And so this is really public perception, uh, you know, at work. The facts are important, but public perception. Uh, is also about politics and what people think and what people feel. And this is, I think, where we need to be aware as an industry that just hammering on facts will not make the sector be loved or appreciated or uh, accepted by the public opinion. And public opinion, I think, equals politicians. And if you ever want to have a good functioning market, I think public opinion and politicians need to be uh, in the back of your mind. 
So we, we came out with a statement. Uh, actually, the idea came from Peter Paul de Goei from the SSV slash Noga. I don't know precisely what the name is, but we came up with a joint statement where we committed uh, with 14 other national associations that we would not refer to the word COVID, crisis, lockdown, and in general, be very careful with your marketing. Uh, and it was a public statement that was appreciated, I think, by the CASA, but also by other regulators. I think this is the kind of leadership and responsiveness to society that we should uh, show. Uh, two more things I would like to say there. Advertising, um, I mean, this is really the key. Um, I think our interlocutor with the outside world is advertising. Advertising makes the sector visible to the larger audience. And I think that's a very big audience that most of them are not going to gamble. But nevertheless, we reach out to those people. Most of those people will at best have a neutral position towards gambling and most likely, more likely be relatively negative. So we need to be careful with advertising. And I think this, uh, as the Casa itself said, the wave of advertising that will come because there will be competition for the market, uh, as was again said in the market vision document, is something that we need to be mindful of. It will happen and it will hopefully die down. But if we have a phased in period of licenses, uh, as might be the result of the motion postuma, depending on how it will be implemented, I think the net effect of that will be a very prolonged, very intense uh, period of advertising, which will have a backlash, I think, on public opinion, because if you have a unnecessary long, intense period of advertising, uh, people will get annoyed and fed up by it sooner and quicker than when you have it in a rather short moment in time. Um, so that's about the advertising intensity, something to be mindful of also towards the, the CASA, I think. Uh, we as EGBA, we developed a code of conduct, um, my last point. We developed a code of conduct for, for advertising as part of our responsibility, taking leadership. And uh, it covers um, all, uh, it's very wide scope, it covers all ways of advertising. So it's broadcasting, sponsorship, marketing, social media as well. And we, uh, it is about the content. So it says what you can and cannot do in terms of advertising. Uh, and it, our members will be bound by it. And uh, operators that are not members of EGBA can sign up to it. And we would encourage you to do so. It has been already uh, supported by uh, SSV as well, other national associations. And actually, we're also going to be monitored against it. We're currently in discussions with a European body of uh, advertising authorities. Um, who uh, are interested in uh, monitoring our code. We haven't signed the contract yet, uh, but probably we will. If that's the case, it will be in the Netherlands, it will be the Reclame Code Commissie who will then start monitoring our members and in any operator here in the audience or anywhere else that would like to uh, commit to that um, code of conduct as well. And you'll be monitored against it. The good thing, of course, is that you show leadership, you commit yourself to doing something extra, and in that way, you, um, yeah, you, you show that you care about what's happening and not just limit yourself to complying with the rules as they are. Last but not least, just in support of uh, Peter as well, I think uh, the last point, it's about studies, fact-based policy making. We don't have enough facts. We really don't. Uh, I think there's a lot of information that we don't have, but policies are being made on the hoof, so to speak. England, so not even the United Kingdom, but England is the only one that really uh, regularly publishes prevalence rates. I mean, the, 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 let's say the good news is that they seem to be very stable, uh, 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 but for a European study, 2013, uh, as far as I'm aware, the last prevalence study in the Netherlands is from 2011, but I'm not sure, I might be mistaken. But this is not the basis to make serious policy on. I think I would encourage uh, the Dutch government, but also operators, to make sure that we have more data available, because I think that's what's lacking, despite the fact that we're really making important decisions about policy, about individuals and about people's lives as well. I think I need to, to leave it here. Martin, please stay here. Thank you very much, uh, first of all, for your, for your insights. Um, you please stay where, you, no, stay where you are. I think okay. that's um, best. So we still have slider open for questions from the audience. If you're watching the stream from abroad, or here in Amsterdam, please add your questions to Slido. Uh, we have a first question there also from the room. 
There's the possibility to ask a question with a microphone. In that case, just raise your hand. Let's go to the first question. How attractive, Martin, will the Dutch regulated online market be? How many viable license applications do you expect? I mean, the number of viable license applications, I don't know. I think the, the Dutch market as such is, is an interesting uh, opportunity. 17 million people, uh, rich, relatively rich, rich. Uh, and as such, I think there is a, a good opportunity here. I think it depends also on how the blight scales will be uh, developed. Uh, and, and I have to say that 29% taxation, uh, we estimate that channeling rate will be less than 80% meaning you have to compete with the black market operators that go for the other 20, 25% on the market. And I think there's a lot to be, uh, we can't take it for granted that it will be an interesting, viable, good functioning market. I'm, I'm, yes, it has potential, whether it will be viable, I don't know. And on top of that, we, will, we might get a digital European tax on top of it as well, which would make it even less attractive. Thank you, thank you. Any more questions from the room? We have a boom operator here. Let's see if there's is there a second question um, in Slido. Nothing right now. Yes, sorry, quick question. If 50% of online gambling is sports betting, which was reduced to zero, then a 10% decrease is actually a big increase in online casino gambling. Um. I think uh, mathematics is also a, a particular subject. I think, I don't know who asked the question, but that, that's, that's a bit difficult to say without seeing the figures underneath. Yeah, okay, maybe we get back in that uh, in the and if there, if, there are, if there are figures there that support it, then I can yeah, comment so on them. But percentage is always a difficult one and not, not a lot of people get that right. Okay, so we get back to that in our post-conference report. Um, there are a quick last question here. What's e EGBA's view on possible licensing of affiliates? I mean, that's a, it's a good question. So for our advertising code of conduct, uh, our members' affiliates, with whom they have a contract, will also be part of the monitoring exercise. So there are their contractual relationships, whether they should be separately licensed. I think we need to be careful that we don't over-regulate. There's a risk there as well. So I, I, I would not say no, no, but I, I, I'll be careful. Okay. That's quite clear. Thank you for the update. Martin, again, thank you very much. Always <laughs> bedankt.